Hi there, I'm glad to welcome you to my channel, World of Stories. I have a lot of interesting life stories that I want to share with you. Enjoy listening. The sweet dream didn't want to release its grip, but an inner voice kept insisting monotonously. Buster, wake up. Otherwise, you'll oversleep again. He reluctantly opened his eyes, and his first conscious glance fell on the alarm clock. Damn. It's already half past seven. I thought I wound you up. The last sentence was directed at the soulless timepiece that beeped whenever it pleased. Buster shook his fist at the alarm clock. Lately, you've been failing at your duties and letting me down frequently. I'll throw you away today. Apparently, the owner's threat had an immediate effect on the old chronometer, as it emitted a feeble sound after his last words. The man remarked ironically. You can't deny it, you're quite a piece of work. I wound you up at half past six, and you woke me up an hour later. I'm definitely doomed now. Buster took a deep breath and shouted in a resonant voice. My little darlings, wake up. Bessie, Veronica, get up. Observing Buster getting dressed would have resembled scenes from early 20th century cinema chronicles. It took the young man, and an exemplary father, only two minutes for dressing, washing, and stretching. Buster was glad that modern fashion trends exempted him from the obligatory morning shave, otherwise, he would have spent another five minutes perfecting his appearance. But his week-long stubble added a touch of ruggedness to his look, which appealed to women. Sounds from the children's room indicated that his two daughters were already awake and in the active phase of getting ready for daycare. Just to be sure, he peeked into his little princess's bedrooms. The rooms were almost perfectly tidy, and the beds were neatly made. This fact particularly pleased the father, and he thought that the military routine established many years ago disciplined even the little girls. To encourage his daughters, Buster spoke in a fakir's voice. My clever little fairies. If you behave well in daycare today, you'll receive a reward tonight. Tell me your secrets, what do you want the most? The girls jumped in place and shouted eagerly. Ice cream in a big cone. No, better take us to the zoo. These childish desires melted the man's heart, and he kissed the girls tenderly. You'll have both ice cream and the zoo today. If you behave well at daycare. Veronica gave her father a condescending look. Dad, we're already big girls, and you talk to us as if we were three years old. Although he couldn't see much difference between the two age periods, he hastily apologized. I'm sorry, ladies, if I offended you. I didn't think it was so important to you. By the way, all women want to look younger. Buster Brown had learned to multitask. While talking to the children, he expertly combed the girl's hair and tied two ponytails on each of their heads. Following her father's example during the morning routine, Bessie pulled on her tights, she focused on a single thought and didn't get distracted by other conversations. Therefore, she was ready to go out before her sister. After finishing the dressing process, Bessie also bestowed her father with a condescending look and expressed her opinion. Dad, adult ladies try to look younger, but Veronica and I are still growing up. Everything will be different when we're older. Buster was always amazed at his six-year-old daughter's thoughtfulness. According to the birth records, Bessie came into the world half an hour earlier than Veronica, so she rightfully took on the role of the older sister. It didn't take much for her to make a remark to her father. On this April morning, the girl also decided to remind him of the most important thing. Dad, don't you think we've chatted enough? In ten minutes, Uncle Harry will close the gates, and we'll end up stuck at your workplace all day, just like last time. Buster sped up the process. Spending the workday with his twins didn't appeal to Buster Brown. It was associated with a whole set of additional problems. He didn't bother checking the time to confirm Bessie's statement. He commanded in a lively voice. Attention, girls. Our main task is to beat Uncle Harry. The twins enthusiastically accepted this challenge. They rushed out of the apartment with loud cries. At that inconvenient moment, a neighbor on the same floor also decided to leave her flat. She cast a sideways glance at the shouting girls and then favored Buster himself with a cold look. She lectured in an admonishing tone. 
uncontrolled behavior in children speaks of their parents' irresponsibility. The man smiled. Good morning, Mrs. Watson. It's very nice to see you too. The girls also greeted the elderly woman cheerfully. Hello. Bessie thought that one wish for good health wasn't enough and added. And tonight, Dad will take us to the zoo. Mrs. Watson, with the same haughty tone, said. I'm very happy for you. She raised her eyes to the ceiling of the elevator cabin and continued. I remember my parents used to take me to the theater in my childhood. They tried to instill in me a love for the arts from a young age. I don't understand how a zoo is better than the theater? Buster easily understood that this question was directed at him and replied to the neighbor without hesitation. Mrs. Watson, interacting with animals is also beneficial for children's development because such contacts instill love for our lesser brothers and nature in general. The elevator stopped, and its doors screeched open, releasing the passengers in different directions. The neighbor wanted to argue, hoping for a continuation of the conversation. That's a cliché. People use it only when they have nothing else to say. Buster turned around. Right now, I indeed have nothing else to say to you because Uncle Harry is about to close the daycare gates. He said this line in a distorted voice, and the girls squealed with delight again. Dad, you're amazing, just like Mangiafoco from Pinocchio's Tale. Mrs. Watson froze in astonishment. As a true connoisseur of art, she was impressed by Buster's acting skills. Perplexed, she mumbled. I think that line sounds more like a wolf. True, the theater cashier didn't specify which wolf Buster's successful impromptu reminded her of. After all, this wicked character appears in many fairy tales, and he's different in each one. Leaving Mrs. Watson in contemplation, Brown and his daughters settled into the car, which the head of the family had wisely left in the building's parking lot the night before. The journey to the daycare center, romantically named Rainbow, took exactly three minutes. The grumpy janitor had already closed the gates, but Bessie rushed to the security checkpoint. Uncle Harry, please wait. The girl squeezed through a narrow gap and called her sister. Veronica, hurry up. Dad, you can go to work, we'll manage ourselves. Otherwise, you'll get a reprimand. Buster Brown watched as his daughters, holding hands, walked toward the main building. This scene filled him with tenderness, and he thought about how quickly his little girls were growing up. It was a pity that Glories couldn't see this. His melancholic thoughts were interrupted by an unpleasant metallic screech. Uncle Harry was closing the gates in his own peculiar way, winding the door leaves with an iron chain. Seeing Buster's surprised look, the janitor said significantly. This is the last time I'm this kind. Next time, I won't let you in. We have the same rules for everyone, and I won't make exceptions for chronic violators. For the first time in his life, Buster was categorized this way. He didn't like the term used by the janitor, but he didn't plan to argue with Uncle Harry because the clock was relentlessly ticking away seconds and minutes. Only in the parking lot near the office did he nervously glance at the dial of the brand new watch recently given to him by his father for his 30th birthday. Well, seven minutes late. Now the boss will express his dissatisfaction. His speeches always make my toothache again. Recently, Buster Brown had noticed that he experienced toothaches for unknown reasons during conversations with his boss. He even consulted a dentist friend about it, but the dentist just laughed and said. Your teeth would be the envy of anyone. Pain is a form of negative reaction, like an allergy. He had to take the specialist's word for it. Even though the boss was a very kind person and never caused negative emotions in Brown, he couldn't help but feel that today he was likely to run into trouble. But Buster hadn't even reached his department when his mobile phone rang, displaying a familiar set of numbers on the screen. The young man whispered in resignation. Boss. He's going to scold me thoroughly now. Mr. Adams ordered shortly. Brown, come to my office immediately. With a heavy heart. Buster entered the reception area. The secretary gestured that the boss was waiting for him. Mr. Adams was studying some documents. He briefly looked away from the papers. Brown. You're like the flying Dutchman to me. 
I just think about catching you, and you've already melted away like a ghost. Buster pleaded. Mr. Adams. You know that I have special circumstances. How long are you going to hide behind this excuse? Find a good woman, get married, and all your problems will vanish. The girls will have a mother, and you'll have a life partner. Thanks for the valuable advice, but I don't have time for romance. Besides, my daughters are mature beyond their years. They'll start school in the fall, and it will be easier then. The boss pointed to a chair. Sit down. Excuses won't change the situation. And don't think I'm prying into your personal life. It's just painful to watch you struggle alone. But I called you here for a different reason. We have another significant client, and I don't want him to slip away. Look at these documents and think about what can be done in terms of security. You're a pro in this field, which is why I decided to assign you to this job. Buster picked up the folder with the documents, and the boss continued. This is the client's wish list. It's better if you study it at home, it will be more reliable that way. I think you can handle it in two days. Besides, you'll get some rest. Buster didn't expect such a generous gift from his boss. Mr. Adams, thank you. I didn't even dare to dream of such a surprise. I guarantee that you'll receive a detailed plan from me exactly 48 hours from now. Mr. Adams impatiently interrupted. There's no need to rush with the plan. Later, you'll discuss the details with the client in person. You'll present the list of suggestions first. Why am I even telling you this? You know better than me. Buster wanted to reply to his boss, but he waved his hand dismissively. That's enough, Brown, go, don't waste my time. When Buster grabbed the door handle, Mr. Adams suddenly laughed. Wait, Brown. You have such a memorable last name. It suits you perfectly. Tell me, how were you teased in school? Buster felt himself blush, but answered confidently. They were afraid to tease me. You were that cool? Not me, but my dad. He was the chief of the district police department. Wow. The boss's expression changed sharply, and he looked at Buster with respect. I won't keep you any longer, Buster Brown. Good luck. Brown left the chief's office and breathed a sigh of relief. He absentmindedly put the folder with the documents in his briefcase and headed to his department to inform his colleagues. Upon his arrival, Jim lazily raised his hand in greeting. His friend and colleague was enthusiastically devouring something, making it impossible for him to speak clearly. Buster put a heavy hand on his shoulder. Are you eating wherever you want again? And then there are crumbs all over the office. Jim. Sometimes you need to get out from behind the desk, there's a real world beyond the virtual one. Jim looked at him reproachfully. Buster, what was that just now? Did you deliberately annoy me this morning? No, not at all. I care about your health. Well, then, I forgive you this time. Did you know the boss was looking for you this morning? I've already checked in with him. He sent me home on a two-day assignment. Jim even jumped in his place. Man, some people have all the luck. And here I am stuck here for days. To avoid getting completely stale, you need to air yourself out occasionally. All right, I'm off. I'll be in touch. Jim made another vague gesture with his hand and sank his teeth into something wrapped in a white napkin. He emitted a bouquet of gastronomic aromas. Buster gave his friend another useful piece of advice. Jim, you should indulge in such food less, it's harmful. But it's delicious. Buster knew it was pointless to argue with his friend. He decided not to waste any more time and hurried out the door. His imagination was already painting a picture of how he could spend the day pleasantly and with maximum benefit. But his fantasies were interrupted by an unfamiliar lady who got stuck in the turnstile at the entrance. Like a true gentleman, Buster helped the girl deal with the disobedient device, and in gratitude, she bestowed him with a charming smile. Thank you so much. If it weren't for you, I would have had to sit here captive until evening. Brown replied. It wouldn't have come to that. 
We have a real professional security guard here who rescues those who can't pass the entrance test. Flirting with women wasn't in the young man's plans, so he hastened towards the exit, throwing fleeting glances at this strange individual. The thought crossed his mind, it's the 21st century, and some people can't handle such a primitive device as a turnstile. Then he thought that the girl might be from a village, unable to orient herself. But her appearance didn't stick in his memory, and soon he forgot about her entirely. Everything extraneous moved to the background, and he tried to tune himself to a positive wave. For a man who single-handedly raised two daughters, two days off seemed like luxury. It remained only to use this gift from the boss wisely. His mood was slightly spoiled when Buster entered his building. Near the elevator, he saw the unyielding Mrs. Watson. Forgetting that they had already met in the morning, he cheerfully said. Have a good day. The neighbor stared at him with a sharp look and then shook her head disapprovingly. We've already met. And it was less than an hour ago. So young, yet such a short memory. Although such things often happen to those who drink anything stronger than coffee in the morning. It took Buster a moment to realize what Mrs. Watson suspected him of, and when he understood, he wanted to send this old woman far away, but he refrained from extreme rudeness and said cheerfully. Don't judge others by yourself, Mrs. Watson. The elevator stopped with a bang, but Buster didn't feel like going up to his floor in the company of the unpleasant neighbor. Just the thought of it caused violent protests in his sensitive soul, and a whole squadron of goosebumps ran down his spine. Therefore, Buster Brown decided to go on foot, and he covered the first flight of stairs in about two seconds. In that time, Mrs. Watson understood the meaning of the last words spoken by the young neighbor. By the time she had entered the elevator, she shouted loudly enough for the entire building to hear. What are you implying? Are you calling me a drunkard? Me, a sick woman who could be your mother. This is an insult. Mark my words, I will complain about you. Buster ran up the stairs, whistling a carefree tune. The small revenge against the nasty neighbor lifted his spirits a bit, but as soon as he entered the apartment, his mobile phone reminded him that a modern person couldn't become invisible even for a moment. It was his father calling. Buster. Have you completely forgotten about my existence? Do you still have a father, or have you given up on that too? Over the years of working in the law enforcement agencies, Mr. Brown Sr. had gotten used to demanding unwavering obedience from his subordinates. He established the same order in his family after retiring. He couldn't let go of this habit even after his well-deserved retirement. Although Buster asked his father to tone it down every time. This time, he calmly replied. Dad, don't scold me. You know I'm swamped with work. His father only slightly eased the pressure and grumbled. What work could you possibly have? You spend entire days in your office in front of the computer. Is that a job for a real man? Dad. You're always right. A real man must just run around in attics and catch criminals. Mr. Brown Sr. liked the joke. He chuckled. Buster, you always manage to twist everything your way. But thanks for cheering me up. Why am I calling you? I don't know. Please enlighten me with your secret. I have a new addition to the household. My Rosie became a mother recently. Buster felt a wave of nausea. Dad, what are you talking about? Who's Rosie? Mysterious laughter from his father was heard again. Rosie is my young goat. I bought her almost for a song in the neighboring village last year. Buster breathed a sigh of relief. Thank goodness. I thought you got married. Well, why not? It's a good idea. I should consider it. After all, when a man is slightly over 60, he can still make a woman happy. The same characteristic laughter followed, and then Mr. Brown Sr. said quite seriously. All right, enough jokes. Son, I'm lonely here. Would you and the granddaughters come over for the weekend? Okay, Dad, we'll consider your invitation. I think the girls will be thrilled at the prospect of playing with the little kid goat. Besides the kid goat, I have another surprise for them, and I've prepared a nice gift for you too. A deep melancholy resonated in Mr. Brown's voice, making Buster feel a bit uneasy. 
He thought that he rarely visited his father, especially lately. Dad, I'll try. No, I promise we'll come visit you. I'll be waiting for you. His father hung up first, and Buster still held the phone to his ear. After a few minutes of contemplation, he made a philosophical conclusion. Life is a strange thing. We all rush, trying to redo a bunch of things, and in this hustle and bustle, we forget about those who love us. For Buster, his father had always been the ultimate authority since childhood. His portrait in a solid frame always stood on the programmer's desk. The young man winked at the image in the photo and murmured softly. Hang in there, dad. We'll definitely make it, but first, I need to go through this pile of papers. Buster carefully pulled out the folder his boss had given him from his briefcase and started going through the sheets covered in illegible handwriting. The content of the documents puzzled him and he frequently exclaimed. What nonsense is this? I wonder if the person who wrote this has any idea about programming. These seem to be notes of a madman. The boss has burdened me with quite a task. You could say he's given me a real headache. Buster was about to grab his phone to express his thoughts to Mr. Adams about the new assignment. But at that moment, his father's image appeared before him, and his trademark phrase echoed in his mind. Son, pull yourself together. Orders from above aren't up for discussion. The Brown family had argued to the point of madness on this issue many times, but Mr. Brown Sr.'s argument had always prevailed. If everyone does as they please, there will be no order. That's precisely why our country fell apart in the 90s, and we mustn't allow a repeat of that tragedy. All of Buster's arguments seemed weak against this time-tested fact. Although he himself remembered that period quite vaguely, there were undeniable facts confirming that those turbulent years had taken their toll on their family. Zach Brown was born and raised in a settlement that was considered a large village. His father, Kevin Brown, was respected by the villagers because he had been performing the duties of the local police officer for over a quarter of a century. Many times he had thwarted crimes and received gratitude from his superiors. But what impressed young Zack the most was the gun holstered on his father's belt. Zack's rich imagination painted the most exciting pictures of battling criminals, and he enthusiastically narrated these stories, invented by him, to his school friends. The boy believed so strongly in his own fantasies that he once wrote in an essay how his father single-handedly captured an entire gang of criminals. The teacher appreciated the boy's creative abilities, giving him the lowest grade. Apart from the poor Mark, she decided to discourage Zack from any desire to deceive and read the child's composition aloud to the whole class. But when she closed the notebook, one of the girls said. Wow. Almost like Conan Doyle. The teacher expected a completely different reaction. She hoped the children would condemn the liar, but they all praised Zack Brown. What infuriated the teacher the most was that Debbie Long, an excellent student and a social activist, sided with the liar. The teacher decided to speak up about it. Oh my, Brown and Conan Doyle? Debbie Long, could you have come up with anything more ridiculous? Can you compare a classic detective genre with a mere liar who so casually uses his father's name? Debbie was not taken aback. Mrs. Foster. Artistic imagination is always present in literature. Even famous writers actively use this technique. By the way, Sherlock Holmes is a fictional character. Although he had a prototype. The teacher didn't let the top student finish. Don't act smart, Debbie Long, and don't try to defend Brown. Mrs. Foster was not someone to give up. She called Zack's father to the school for a serious conversation. Kevin Brown patiently listened to all the teacher's complaints, and then unexpectedly for her, he asked. May I have a look at my son's composition? Of course, no problem. The teacher searched through a stack of notebooks for a while until she found the required copy and said sarcastically. Here is your son's masterpiece. Read it. Kevin Brown read his son's composition with interest. What's the problem? Zack has no mistakes, and it's well written. I don't understand your complaints? Mrs. Foster was flustered because she had once again been mistaken in her assumptions. Raising her voice, she remarked. 
I understand your paternal feelings, but there is not a word of truth in what your son wrote. How do you know that? This question left the teacher at a loss. She blinked her eyes frequently and began to mutter. But what your son wrote simply cannot be true. Mrs. Foster. How can you judge something you have no knowledge of? And, I must point out, you shouldn't clip the wings of children at the beginning of their flight. I'm not talking about my son specifically, but about children in general. A teacher should understand children's souls, and what are you doing? Kevin Brown believed that further conversation with the class teacher was pointless. He left the classroom without saying, Goodbye, Mrs. Foster muttered angrily. What a family. Well, never mind. I won't let this Brown off the hook. He'll still dance to my tune. After that incident, the class teacher started picking on Zach without reason. Her daily nitpicking had so spoiled the boy's life that he once said. I don't want to go to this school anymore. Kevin Brown tried to calm his teenager. Zach, you're a man. Pull yourself together and I'll try talking to your teacher again. The boy objected. No, dad, please don't. Because that will only make it worse. I've thought about it. It's better if you help me transfer to another school. Zach, there's only one school in our village. Then I'll ride my bicycle to Madison or Raffin. Kevin Brown gave in and asked the school director in Raffin, whom he knew well, to admit his son. Within a week, Zach was transferred to that educational institution. Debbie Long also transferred to the same school. She immediately warned Constantine. Don't think I left because of you. I just stand for justice. In autumn and spring, the teenagers rode their bicycles to the Raffin School, and in bad weather and winter, Zach's father drove them there. Kevin Brown often repeated the proverb. When there is no grief, the ant buys a piglet. And that's what you kids did. You organized a public protest because of a trivial essay. In those years, in the West, the youth actively fought against injustice, and this fighting spirit gradually penetrated through the Iron Curtain into the country of triumphant socialism. Therefore, many representatives of the younger generation tried to prove their righteousness in such an extraordinary way from the school desk. However, over time, the fighting spirit gradually waned, and Zack and Debbie made quite realistic plans for their adult lives. Having successfully completed their education, the friends went separate ways. Debbie enrolled in university in the chemical technology department, while Constantine decided to continue his father's noble work. After school, he was sent back to his hometown by the police school. He worked as a local police assistant in the same Raffin where he had studied. He liked the job, but he wasn't satisfied with the scale, so he decided to consult his father. Dad, I respect any job, but I want to fully realize myself. Kevin Brown had nothing else to say but to advise his son. If you don't find satisfaction in the role of a police assistant, enroll in the police academy while your age allows it. In the same autumn, Zach enrolled in a higher educational institution, and after graduation, his career took a sharp turn upwards. Initially, he was appointed as the deputy chief of one of the states, and later he became the head of that department. While everything was going well in Captain Brown's professional life, there was a huge gap in his personal life. Until the age of 30, he remained a bachelor. His parents constantly said to him, Zach, you will remain a bachelor because of your work. He usually brushed it off, attributing it to a lack of time. No woman would want to share me with my job. But such a bold woman was found. It turned out to be his school friend, Debbie Long. The former classmates met completely by chance in a department store. They wanted to talk, reminisce about their school days, and Constantine took Debbie's phone number, promising her. As soon as I lighten up a bit at work, I'll call you. Debbie eagerly awaited his call. She, too, hadn't managed to build her own family nest because she considered her work to be the most important thing in life. But with age, her values changed, and Debbie realized with surprise that personal happiness was still more important for a woman. However, since all her female friends were already married, and some had even divorced, Debbie suffered from loneliness in the evenings and on holidays. When she met Zach, whom she had secretly been in love with in her youth, a glimmer of hope timidly lit up in her heart. 
She patiently waited for his call, but Mr. Brown showed up only after two weeks. He apologized and then said with a laugh. To avoid any more unforeseen events, I invite you to a restaurant right now. I think we'll be comfortable there in a relaxed atmosphere. Debbie agreed. The young woman didn't hesitate, and later, when the always busy gentleman proposed. Debbie, we're both adults. So, I'll be straightforward. Let's live together. Seeing a shadow cross the girl's face, he added. I'm sorry, I expressed it clumsily. I'm not good at speaking beautifully. In short, I ask you to be my wife. Debbie agreed. They got married a month later, and half a year later, they moved into a three-room apartment. Although the accommodation was provided by his job, it didn't matter much to the young family, and soon their first child was born, a son named Buster. It was their first family trip in their own car. Initially, Buster wanted to take the train, but he imagined spending almost half a day on the journey and changed his mind. When choosing the mode of transportation, the thoughtful father took into account his daughter's age and their increased activity level. He knew that his girls wouldn't be able to sit still for long and would be running around the train compartment, bothering other passengers. He thought, although there are risks, it's faster to travel under our own steam. When he told his daughters that they would be going to grandpa's in their own car, Veronica did an acrobatic trick out of joy. Hooray! We're going to grandpa's on daddy's car. Bessie reacted more calmly to the upcoming trip and even gave her father some sound advice. Dad, we need to stop by the mall and buy Grandpa a gift. You can't visit someone without a gift. Grandpa might get offended. Buster thought that Bessie would grow up to be a real homemaker. He had missed this important detail in the hustle, and his daughter reminded him. He remembered Gloria again with sadness, who had tragically died due to his own carelessness. Memories of his wife, the marriage with whom had lasted only three years, always painfully struck the man's heart, but this pain dulled over time. The saddest part was that with years passing, Buster began to realize that their short-lived marriage was a mistake. The man often caught himself thinking. Regardless, sooner or later, Gloria and I would have separated because we were too different. Perhaps it was this realization that hindered Buster from daring to attempt a second chance at personal happiness. In the four and a half years since he became a young widower, he had only dared to have a romantic involvement once with a colleague from work. But Julia quickly disappointed him when, in a group, she carelessly expressed her views on family happiness. Personally, I don't believe in love tales. It's all made up for naive people who need to balance the demographic curve. In my opinion, material well-being is the driving force in building a family. When people have money, they can afford a certain level of comfort. And the more money, the cozier life is. And when a person is in the most comfortable conditions, they try to preserve it all. Jim then objected to Julia. Julia. According to you, apart from delicious food and a warm bed, people don't need anything else? It seems to me that this primitive existence can satisfy beings accustomed to a parasitic lifestyle. Did you forget about children? Children are the main incentive for creating and maintaining a family. Julia listened to Jim and snorted disdainfully. For your information, Jim, many married couples opt out of having children, and there are many advantages to such a decision. Julia wanted to elaborate on this thought, but Jim shut her down with one phrase. I wouldn't want to have a companion in life like you, Julia. And it's a good thing that most women are talkative and readily express everything that's on their minds. Thanks to this trait, you can understand who you're dealing with. Julia was deeply offended by Jim, and Buster quickly ended the budding romance. The girl was surprised by her admirer's sudden mood swings and even demanded an explanation from him. Without going into details, Buster calmly responded. Julia, it won't work between us. Why? You don't believe in love, and I do. You don't like children, but I have two daughters. Buster, I have nothing against your girls. We can hire a governess. Your salary allows for it. My girls need a mother, not a strict governess. They parted ways with Julia forever, but there was still a lingering bitterness in the young man's heart after the short-lived romance. 
Of course, Buster didn't plan to live a monastic life, but he dreamed of meeting a simple and kind woman who could be a mother to his twin daughters. As the girls grew older, this thought visited the lonely father more and more often. He pondered his unsettled life during a trip to the neighboring state, where his father decided to spend the rest of his life. During the first half of the journey, the girls kept themselves busy with games, then they grew tired of playing and fell asleep. Buster maintained a minimal speed to avoid disturbing the little princess's sleep, and by the end of the journey, he was exhausted himself, nearly stumbling out of the car when he finally got out. Mr. Brown welcomed his guests at the gate of his small but well-maintained estate. The granddaughters immediately captured their grandfather's attention, bombarding him with questions. Grandpa, where's the little goat? Can it walk already? Can we play with him? Retired Colonel Brown managed to answer their questions while setting the table. Buster observed these preparations, his eyes gradually closing. The last thing he heard were his father's words. Bessie, Veronica. Let your dad rest a bit after the journey. We'll go see what our Leonard is up to. Buster thought that his father had chosen a fitting name for the little goat. After that thought, he completely disconnected from reality and drifted into a pleasant half-dream. He dreamed of his mother, who had been killed by bandits. Then the image of glories flashed in his mind. He even had time to think in his dream that some kind of ominous fate hung over the men of the Brown family because his grandmother died prematurely in a tragic way. The same sad fate awaited his mother and then his wife. He didn't have time to finish this thought because his father lightly touched his shoulder. Buster, wake up. It's time for us to have a snack and a drink. Of course, Dad. We'll definitely have a drink. Just let me wake up a bit. He tried to emerge from the sweet abyss of dreams and muttered. Phew, some mystique. Thanks, Dad, for waking me up, I had such a weird dream. And what or whom did you see? You won't believe it, Father. First, I dreamt of Grandma, then Mom. It was a bit creepy. I hadn't even been thinking about them. Old folks say that the dead appear when the weather is about to change. Maybe it's going to rain. They said so on TV, and my barometer shows it. Mr. Brown pointed his finger at the device resembling a compass hanging on the wall. Buster got up from the chair where he had been caught by sleep. To fully wake up, he began to stretch his stiff joints, sharing his concerns with his father. I didn't think I'd find this trip so challenging. Nothing surprising. You're used to driving around the city, five minutes, and you're there. I'm afraid of going long distances myself. Although I have more experience than you do. Mr. Brown was ready to tell his son about the difficulties of farm life, but Buster looked around and asked with unmistakable concern. Father, where are the girls? We can't leave them alone, they might get up to mischief. Elder Brown smiled. Don't worry unnecessarily. The granddaughters are under reliable supervision. Mr. Brown winked mysteriously and beckoned his son. Come with me. You'll see the entertainment they came up with. Just be quiet, so you don't scare them away. Step by step, Buster followed his father through the narrow passages of the house. His father always amazed him with his originality. When he decided to become a farmer after his bustling days as a policeman, Buster had laughed at him. Dad. You can't live in the village, and a quiet, peaceful life isn't your style either. Believe it or not. I don't think you'll make a farmer out of yourself. Mr. Brown didn't try to prove anything back then but wisely remarked. I have my doubts too, but we'll see how it goes. From his last service position as a retired colonel, he went straight to his homeland. He registered the apartment in the city for his son. You're young, it's more convenient for you to live in the city. I'll find myself a refuge in the village. It's comfortable and calm there. However, not much remained of the large village where he had grown up. The parental house was in such a state that it was scary to enter. Mr. Brown was a bit saddened and sought advice from local authorities. The officials sympathized with the retired officer and promised to assist him in every possible way. They allocated a plot of land near his stepfather's house. And then everything went smoothly. 
The man tidied up the house, built two small barns. He used all his savings for these transformations, but he didn't regret it. When his son offered to send him money, he firmly stated. Thank you, Buster, for your concern, but I can handle it on my own. I'll take up farming. Maybe something good will come out of it. To start, Mr. Brown got a few rabbits because he had experience dealing with these animals. A bit later, Brown decided to expand his farm and got two goats, and last year, he acquired another one, which later gave birth to a kid named Leonard. As a former law enforcement officer, Brown couldn't allow nameless entities to reside in his jurisdiction. Therefore, everyone, including rabbits, chickens, and goats, had personal nicknames. Hearing the lively cries of his daughters from a distance, Buster decisively headed in the direction of those sounds. However, Mr. Brown said. Wait, don't rush. Come here. Take a look at what they're up to. Buster followed his father's gesture and barely held back his laughter. The sisters were riding a little kid on a children's scooter, while three adult goats observed this activity. It seemed that Tessie and Charlotte were also eager to take a turn. Only Rosie, Leonard's mother, made sounds of concern and anxiously watched the girls. Veronica explained to the young mother. Don't worry, Rosie. He won't fall. We'll teach him how to ride, and then Grandpa will arrange Leonard's show in the circus. The men exchanged glances, and Buster asked. Dad. Admit it. Did you persuade them for these plans? What are you talking about? They came up with everything themselves. Imaginative little ones. All credit to Grandpa. Mr. Brown made this conclusion with pride, but his moment of glory was short-lived because his son asked. If I understand correctly, is this your surprise for the granddaughters? Besides the kid, did you decide to gift them scooters too? The retired colonel broke into a smile. Exactly. Is my gift bad? No, not at all. It's a fitting present. Kids in our town ride around on these things. Dad. Did you plan something for me too? By the way, you mentioned that the girls are under supervision, but I don't see anyone. The elderly man averted his eyes and busily rearranged garden tools. His behavior raised suspicion in his son. Come on, Dad, confess. What else have you planned? Mr. Brown looked around as if to make sure there was no one eavesdropping. Then he cautiously peeked out from behind the corner. Clody. Clody. Where did you disappear to? A pleasant female voice came from nearby. Here I am, Mr. Brown. I decided to tidy up the barn a bit. Before Buster could blink, a charming young woman appeared. Her brown hair was braided into a tight bun, and her cheeks glowed with a healthy flush. For a moment, Buster felt like he had accidentally stepped into the past. Because in this Clody, there was nothing of a modern woman. The young man was shocked, and the girl openly smiled at him, extending her hand. Clody. I imagined you completely differently. He didn't want to appear ignorant, so he shook the girl's hand lightly. I wonder, how did you imagine me? Clody made a loud sound resembling a chuckle. I thought you'd be all modern. All those computer guys are otherworldly. A guy like you from the city came to our post office too. He installed software for us. And what impressed you about that young man? Clody languidly lowered her gaze. He told me all sorts of stories and even invited me to a club. Too bad he left the next day. Buster looked around hoping to find his father. He already realized what the old man was up to. He really wanted to talk to him about this. Clody still stood near the barn where his father had set up living quarters for the goats. She changed the topic of conversation. You have wonderful girls. If it's not a secret, where is their mother? Buster replied irritably. We don't have a mother. She passed away. Clody's eyes widened. Oh my. Tell me, how did it happen? Buster felt that another question, and he would snap at this Clody. After all, no one, not even his closest friends, dared to pry into his soul so boldly. 
Fortunately, just in time, Mr. Brown appeared. Well, youngsters. Here I am. Have you had a chance to meet? It's time for dinner. Bessie, Veronica. Let Leonard rest. Let's go inside. Bessie grabbed the little kid and dragged him to the barn. Veronica followed her sister and scolded her. It's not fair. I want to support the kid too. Do you think just because you're older, you can do whatever you want? Why are you whining all the time? We agreed we would take turns taking care of Leonard. Buster saw a scandal brewing. He decided to bring his daughters to their senses. Stop it right now. If you keep fighting, Grandpa won't let you play with the kid tomorrow, and he'll take the scooters back. Bessie narrowed her eyes cunningly. Daddy, you're just scaring us. Gifts are given forever. Once again, Buster marveled at the cleverness of his elder daughter. Dinner proceeded in a pleasant atmosphere. Clody felt like the hostess of her father's house and ran between the table and the kitchen. Buster guessed that she had prepared so many simple but delicious dishes. He felt embarrassed about his rudeness toward this woman. Wanting to rectify his mistake, he started asking the young woman about rural life. Clody willingly shared her experiences. In my youth, I also dreamed of escaping to the city, but my parents were very ill, so I couldn't leave them. I got a job at the post office and got used to it. Regardless, someone has to live in the village too. The only downside is that there are very few men here. Claudie looked at Buster again, her hope barely concealed, but he pretended not to notice her expressive gaze. Since the family dinner dragged on, Buster had to escort Claudie home. He saw the triumphant gleam in his father's eyes. After returning from his nightly walk, Buster confronted Mr. Brown. Dad, you could have at least warned me. I'm not a kid to be set up like this. Senior Brown went on the offensive. What's wrong with Claudie? She's a good woman. Not spoiled by city life. You're too picky. This way, you'll end up alone, just like me. His father's voice trembled, and Buster felt sorry for the old man. He embraced him by the shoulders. I'm sorry, Dad, but she's just not my type. You're a man, you should understand that I'm into completely different women. I understand you. I just wanted to help you. I'm afraid, son, that you'll repeat my fate. All right, we'll talk tomorrow when there's time. For now, it's time to sleep. Buster saw his father approach the sideboard and gaze at his mother's portrait for a long time. Buster was very young when Debbie Brown died. His father told him the details of that family tragedy when he was in college. Debbie Brown was among the first entrepreneurs who decided to live by the new rules. She knew very well that according to these rules, a portion of the earnings had to be given to those who insured security. But she believed that her husband's position was a reliable guarantee for her. So, she categorically refused to fulfill this condition. She wasn't forgiven for this freedom, and she died right on the landing near their apartment. Her husband and son heard strange crashing sounds, but when they rushed to the landing, it was already too late. Debbie Brown died in her husband's arms. Before her death, she managed to say, Zach, take care of yourself and our son. The criminals were later caught and sentenced to a long prison term, but the Brown family suffered an irreparable loss. Almost a quarter of a century passed, but Mr. Brown never recovered. He couldn't imagine another woman beside him. Translation to English Two days at Grandpa's flew by like a moment. The girls enjoyed the carefree village life so much that they didn't want to go back home. On the eve of their departure, Bessie cast a fishing rod. Father. You said we're already big with Veronica. Buster immediately saw through his daughter's cunning plan but didn't show it. Of course, you're big. You'll go to school in the fall. Dad, if we're big, can't we stay with Grandpa for a little longer? No, sweetheart. You can't. Why? Because Grandpa is already old, and he can't handle all of you alone. Daddy, we'll help him. We can take care of the goats, and the rabbits don't mind us. 
You know, Veronica even held one in her arms, and it wasn't scared. I'm very happy for you, but we have to go back home. You need to go to daycare, and I have to go to work. And we'll definitely come to Grandpa in the summer, just around the time your Leonard will grow up. This promise somewhat reassured the girls, and he overheard them planning to sew a beautiful outfit for the little goat, in which he would later perform in the circus. The short break had a positive effect on the young father's morale. Buster felt a surge of energy as he leisurely climbed to his floor on Monday morning. Jim looked at him in surprise. Buster, are you okay? Yes. Why are you asking such a strange question? Because you came on time today. I thought something had happened during your trip. Buster sat down next to him. You know, you're not far from the truth. Dad decided to take care of me and arranged a date with a girl. He found a suitable bride in the village, according to him, and I had to spend the whole evening talking to her. Jim greeted this news with excitement. So, can I congratulate you? Buster shrugged. Alas, my friend. The matchmaking fell apart because I didn't like the bride, and this whole topic doesn't inspire me. I guess I'm used to a life where everything is clear, everything is routine. On one hand, you're right. But on the other, this world is not interesting without women. Who would know better? When was the last time you went on a date? Jim looked straight into Buster's eyes. You won't believe it, but it was yesterday. Although I can hardly call this meeting a proper date. Jim became serious. Let me paint you a picture of how it went. So, I rushed out for lunch five minutes earlier than usual and bumped into a lady at the entrance. She was there, fidgeting around. Probably waiting for someone. Well, we collided. I apologized, and she smiled and just stared at me. And her gaze was so intense that I felt a pang in my heart. Jim. It probably wasn't your heart. It was your insatiable stomach reminding you of its presence. I wouldn't exclude that option. But you're distracting me from the story. In short, we bumped into each other like two trains in a narrow tunnel. Of course, I apologized. And she asked how to get to the director's office. I escorted her to the boss's office and then went to the bakery. I returned to the office, and she was strolling down the alley. Well, I joined her. And that's it? Seems good enough for a start to me. We talked about various things. I gave her my contact information. Did she give you her phone number? No. She said she lost her mobile a few days ago and hadn't bought a new one yet. Buster patted his friend on the shoulder. Jim, this sounds like a subtle hint for a thick situation. I think you fell for the tricks of a divorce enthusiast. Oh, come on, Brown. You see deceit in everything. Don't take offense. I'm just concerned about you. You're so trusting that someone could easily take advantage of you. Jim didn't reply and stared at his monitor. Buster decided to get back to work and went to his office. He dedicated the first half of the day to a new order. To clarify some details, he had to contact the client, and after a brief phone conversation, the client promised to visit the office after lunch. To ensure the business meeting went smoothly, Buster Brown decided to postpone his meal to a later time. Jim worried about his friend. Buster, hunger makes people irritable and angry. If you can't tear yourself away from your chair, I can bring your lunch to the office. Brown waved his hands. Thanks, Jim, but no need to bother. Imagine the stench that will linger in the office even after a light meal. I want to make a positive impression on the clients, and for that, I can endure a little. Well, suit yourself. Jim headed to the dining area, and Buster delved back into studying the documents. The client arrived at the appointed time. They spent about an hour discussing the new project. After the discussion, the visitor suggested. Buster Brown, I think it's better for you to see the place yourself, understand how things are. There are some nuances, you know, architectural peculiarities of the building our company is renting. I think it's crucial to consider them. Buster considered the client's proposal reasonable and agreed to visit the site. 
In the small park near the office, he noticed a young woman who matched Jim's description. A thought crossed his mind. This is what love does to people. The poor girl is waiting, and her beloved doesn't even suspect. Buster even considered calling his friend but decided against it. It was inconvenient to engage in unrelated conversations with the client present. He thought. No worries. I'll tell him when I get back. However, soon Brown completely forgot about his friend's budding romance and everything else because he spent the rest of the day at the client's office. The building indeed had numerous unpleasant surprises, and unfortunately, Buster realized that he would have to fundamentally change his approach to the project. The client, with an apologetic tone, asked. Tell me honestly, Buster Brown. Did we throw an unsolvable puzzle at you? Since Brown had to maintain his company's reputation, he replied optimistically. Every problem has a solution. But, of course, we'll have to scratch our heads a bit. We'll pay you for everything. You can be sure of that. It's just that we have no other options, and please, if possible, expedite the project. We risk every day without reliable protection. Buster reassured the client. I'll do my best. Translation. He didn't want to go back to the office, but he remembered that his car was still there in the company parking lot. Buster was in a hurry because he had to pick up the girls from daycare. He wanted to quickly pass by the park but noticed the young woman he had encountered after lunch. What a strange person. Spend the whole day here. I wonder what she wants. These thoughts raced through his mind, colliding and disappearing. He didn't even spare a glance for the stranger and only remembered seeing her somewhere before when he was in the car. Buster started recalling events from the past few days, and it struck him. She's the same woman I helped with the turnstile at the entrance last week. Interesting. Very interesting. It can't be a coincidence that this lady hangs around our office for days. She must have a specific purpose. The next morning, the stranger wasn't at her usual spot. However, in the evening, she was strolling in the park again. Buster desperately wanted to interrogate this lady thoroughly, but he walked past her once more. This bizarre game both frightened and exhilarated him. Just in case, he asked Jim. Do you remember the girl I met at the entrance? How's it going with her? Jim waved his hand in despair. Nothing. She never called me. It's been a week, and I think I shouldn't wait for her call anymore. Buster wanted to reassure his friend, but he couldn't. He realized that the stranger was stalking him. The reason behind her surveillance remained to be discovered, and an opportunity presented itself soon. Throughout the week, the sisters looked at the gifts from Grandpa. Buster thought the hallway was the most convenient place for the scooters. Therefore, the girl's suffering reached a critical point twice a day, in the morning and evening. On Friday, the situation reached its peak, and the sisters began to whine. Daddy. We really want to ride. Why won't you let us go to the yard? Buster calmly explained. Playing in the yard can be dangerous because there are cars passing by all the time. Bear with it until Sunday. I'll take you to the park and you can ride there peacefully. The twins rallied slightly and Bessie asked for reassurance. You won't deceive us, right? Have I ever deceived you before? No. Then I will keep my promise this time too. The twins eagerly awaited the weekend. To prevent their father from changing his mind and depriving them of the outing due to bad behavior, they diligently followed all his instructions. After breakfast, the sisters dressed themselves, and with glowing faces, they stepped into the hallway. Daddy, we're ready. Buster was amazed at his own parenting methods. He didn't expect that proper motivation for children could yield such amazing results. With a critical eye, he cheerfully said, observing his daughters. Well, well. I must say, you're both doing great. Grab your scooters, and off we go. The girls ran out to the landing with delighted shouts. Buster hadn't even pressed the elevator button when Mrs. Watson's curly head appeared from the neighboring apartment. The woman had once again forgotten that polite people greet each other when they meet. She immediately expressed her resolute protest. 
I was wondering where all that noise, which was splitting my head into pieces, was coming from in our building. And it turns out my neighbors are roller skating around the apartment. While Mrs. Watson was talking, Buster and his daughters crowded into the elevator cabin. The neighbor slowed her entry a bit, and the automatic doors pressed against her from both sides. She managed to free herself, but she looked at Buster askance. I kindly ask you to maintain order in the living space you occupy. Mrs. Watson, I assure you, everything is in order with us, and no one is roller skating around the apartment. By the way, this wheeled device is called a scooter. Grandpa gave it to my daughters when we visited him. Mrs. Watson's eyes lit up, and she looked affectionately at the girls. They are such sweethearts. No wonder their grandpa spoils them. My grandchildren live far away, they rarely visit. The elevator reached its destination, and all passengers rushed to exit simultaneously. Buster calmly said. Girls, don't forget to let older people go first. The twins made way for the neighbor, and she melted completely. Well done. Listen to your dad. The neighbor's praise lifted the spirits of the sisters, and Bessie even took a step towards building a relationship with the neighbor. You're kind too. Come to our place, and we'll tell you about our grandpa. He has a farm, and there are goats and rabbits there. Oh, how charming. Buster looked at the neighbor and marveled at how a smile transformed a person. This perpetually grumpy woman appeared at least ten years younger and mischievous. Sparks glimmered in her eyes. Mrs. Watson, you're welcome to come for tea tonight. I'll bake some cheesecakes. The brief conversation with the neighbor added positive emotions, and Buster headed to the park with an excellent mood, where the Sunday life was in full swing. Toddlers were digging in the sandbox with abandon, and older kids were sliding down the slides. There were young scooter owners in the park too. Some rode independently, while beginner daredevils were mastering this mode of transport under the supervision of their mothers. Buster encouraged his daughters. Can you manage on your own, or do you need my help? Veronica smiled. Daddy. As if we're little kids. We'll show you how well we can ride. Don't do anything risky, or you might end up with broken noses. Just ride here, so I can see you and without going overboard. Translation Buster struggled to find a free spot on the bench near the fountain and started observing the park visitors. He got so engrossed in this activity that he didn't notice his daughters had disappeared from his sight. He had to go look for them. It turned out the sisters had already found friends, other young scooter enthusiasts. The children organized a competition, and the happy parents watched their little ones with excitement. However, there was only one man in this group of supporters. The moms were casting meaningful glances at him, and he felt uncomfortable under the crossfire of female stares. Suddenly, a familiar silhouette flashed in the crowd of women, and Buster felt uneasy. He thought, Is it my imagination, or is she really here? The man looked around, but he didn't see the strange woman. His mood immediately plummeted, and an inexplicable anxiety crept into his heart. Girls, it's time to go home. We'll come here again next Sunday. He expected the girls to start complaining, but they headed towards the park exit. The sisters outpaced their father and whispered to each other, waiting for him. Buster only heard Bessie's final words. Don't tell dad anything. Understand? Veronica nodded in agreement, but from her pouted lips, Buster could tell that she didn't like the pressure from her older sister. After lunch, the girls wanted to watch cartoons, and at that moment, someone rang the doorbell. Bessie went to the hallway. Dad, I'll open it. It's probably our neighbor who came to visit. Veronica also ran to greet the guest, while Buster switched TV channels, trying to find the one showing cartoons. The hallway was suspiciously quiet, and he called out to his daughters. Where have you two gone? The sisters returned to the living room, their faces frozen in surprise. He cheerfully asked. So, who came to visit us? Bessie, stuttering, whispered. Daddy, there's a lady. We saw her in the park today. Veronica pushed her sister aside. Dad. She said she's our mom. She bought us gifts, 
but we didn't take them without your permission. Buster felt a nauseating lump in his throat. He tightly closed the living room door, ordering his daughters. Stay here. He hurried to the hallway. The woman who had been following him for several days stood there with two bags in her hands, smiling bewilderedly. Nothing infuriated him more than that innocent smile. He approached the stranger. Maybe you can explain what all this means? You've been stalking me for a whole week, and now you barge into my house and talk nonsense. The uninvited guest stammered. I am their real mother, it's true. Buster clenched his fists. Don't you dare utter such blasphemous words in my house. The girl's mother died when they were very young, and I am raising my daughters alone. The woman grabbed his arm. No. No. It's not as you think. Please, listen to me. A bright flash blinded him, and he flung the front door open. Get out of here, and never cross my path again. If I see you near my home or the office again, I will report you where it's due. He pushed the intruder out and slammed the door shut. In the middle of the hallway, there were two packages with gifts. Curiosity got the better of him, and he peeked inside. Each package contained a doll in a beautiful package and inexpensive candies. Buster opened the door again and placed the gifts outside. Take your gifts back. But the woman was no longer on the landing. Mrs. Watson's voice came from the neighboring apartment. She just left in the elevator. Who was that woman? The door of the adjacent apartment cracked open slightly. Mrs. Watson impatiently waited for an answer, and Buster helplessly shrugged his shoulders. I have no idea who she is. But she definitely has something wrong with her head. You know, Buster Brown, there are so many fraudsters nowadays, even women go around apartments, pretending they've got the wrong address. They peek inside to see if there's anything to steal. One of my acquaintances was cleaned out completely. They didn't even hesitate to take used bed linen and towels. Buster listened to his neighbor but was lost in his own thoughts. He understood that this strange woman didn't appear by chance. But why did she choose this moment to make such a bizarre claim? It was incomprehensible. Of course, it was easier to dismiss everything as issues with this lady's mind. But what if her words hid the truth? Most of all, he feared that the answer to this question might be yes. Father's mood was transferred to the twins. They behaved surprisingly quietly for the rest of the day. Buster prepared dinner, unable to shake off the feeling that there was something unusual about that woman he hadn't noticed. He replayed the details of the recent events in his mind over and over again. The mental strain only resulted in a headache, but he never found the answer to the haunting question. Translation in the evening, as she had promised, Mrs. Watson came to visit. The conversation with the neighbor, to Buster's surprise, reduced the tension in the air. They had a pleasant chat on various topics. Buster talked about his father. The girls also contributed to the conversation and shared their personal experience in raising little goats. Mrs. Watson couldn't help but exclaim. How delightful! And here we are, languishing in the city, trying to escape boredom. I'm a village girl too. But my parents traveled around the country for construction work, and then they took me to the city. So, I've lived here my whole conscious life. As they bid farewell, the neighbor said. Buster, if you ever urgently need it, I can babysit your girls. Thank you. I will definitely take you up on your offer. The sisters saw an opportunity for themselves in Mrs. Watson's words. And will you take us to the theater? The woman assured them. Absolutely, I will. If your dad permits, I can even reserve tickets for you in the stalls for a children's play. The girls started jumping with joy. Awesome. We'll go to the theater. Is it as interesting as the circus, dad? Probably, but I'm not sure. Buster was about to close the front door behind Mrs. Watson when she turned around. Although I didn't get a good look at your guest, it seemed to me that your elder daughter resembles her a lot. At first, I even thought she was a relative visiting you. Buster felt a rush of heat. He whispered. That's the answer to my question. 
and I couldn't understand why I was so agitated. But this means that. Buster didn't want to think about the possibility that this woman had told the truth. The idea terrified him, he couldn't even fathom the consequences it might have for his family. No. No. This can't be. Glories couldn't have lied to me. I'm sure they are my daughters. But the seed of doubt had already been planted and was rapidly taking root. All night, the young father couldn't close his eyes. He sat in the kitchen by the wide open window, chain smoking cigarettes. Buster had quit this harmful habit back in his college years, but the strong shock drove him back to it. Buster Brown was one of the few who graduated from university with honors. Even during his studies, he participated in various competitions and often returned victorious. Therefore, in his final year, he received an offer from the dean's office that any student would find hard to refuse. Brown. Stay on for your postgraduate studies. After you defend your thesis, you can teach here, in your alma mater. Buster thought it over, consulted with his father, and agreed. He diligently performed his duties for about a year, and the hard work of the young man was soon rewarded. One fine day, the rector summoned him. Buster Brown. How do you feel about going on an internship to Germany? Brown was so surprised that he even blinked his eyes and just stared, dumbfounded. The rector laughed. Judging by your reaction, I assume you agree? Oh yes, of course. Well, then, settle your affairs and prepare your documents. The unexpected joy was shared with his father, who was at that time tirelessly fighting crime in the Far East. He also shared this news with the girl he had been dating for two months. But contrary to his expectations, Glories received the news without much enthusiasm. Buster, how can you? It means you're leaving me alone to fate's whims? I thought we were serious. Although the young man didn't understand the reason for his beloved girl's discontent, he reassured her. Glories. You know I don't settle for fleeting relationships. Then take me with you. I would love to, but it requires a stamp in the passport. Glories was not one to back down. Then let's get married right now. The girl was determined, and Buster was charmed by her willingness to share his life's challenges. So they went to the marriage registry office, hoping for a quick formalization of their relationship, considering the special circumstances. However, the head of the department smirked. Do you think you're the only clever ones? Couples with valid reasons come here every day, and we have to turn them away because there's a law. So, my future newlyweds, you'll have to wait, and then we'll marry you. But I can accept your application right now. The failure disappointed both of them, but they still hoped for the joint trip. Buster's documents were ready, and Glories was waiting, feeling nervous. The cause for her anxiety wasn't just the delay in preparing the documents, but also an unplanned pregnancy. Of course, she wanted a child, but not right now. So Buster learned just before his departure that he would soon become a father. Glories. You can't imagine what this news means to me. It's not just joy, it's boundless happiness. Their wedding took place in an unusual format, something between a wedding and a christening for an unborn child. The older guests initially tried to reason with the groom, who could only talk about his son. Buster, you can't do this. It's a bad omen. I don't believe in omens. Translation. Mr. Brown arrived for his son's wedding from the Far East, but he didn't share the general enthusiasm. The colonel was an excellent physiognomist and immediately recognized in the bride a gold digger. Gloria didn't behave overtly, but her greedy gaze fixed on every respectable man among the groom's guests, and there were quite a few of them. After the wedding fanfare had subsided, Mr. Brown cautiously asked his son. Buster. What do you know about Gloria? His son immediately became defensive. Sorry. I didn't think I needed to investigate the bride's dossier before marriage. No one is forcing you to dig into the intricacies of her biography. But at least knowing some basic information about the person you're planning to spend your whole life with wouldn't hurt. Where is this Gloria from? Where did she study? Who are her parents? 
These simple questions left the blissful groom perplexed, and he was horrified to realize he truly knew nothing about his young wife. In the early days of their relationship, she had told him a story resembling a soap opera. According to her account, she was raised by a poor aunt, couldn't afford education, and graduated from college, becoming a chef. Later, a kind acquaintance of her aunt's helped the unfortunate orphan get a job in a good restaurant, where she started earning a decent salary. Many details in this story didn't add up. But Buster believed Gloria. He never paid attention to trifles. He wasn't surprised by the fact that the girl, despite her modest profession, had quite a rich wardrobe. The perfect manicure also didn't fit the legend, just like her spending habits. Buster was simply happy and was willing to do anything for the woman he loved, who was about to become the mother of his child in a few months. His departure for the internship was emotional. Gloria cried and pleaded. Buster, my love. Just come back soon. I can't even imagine how I'll manage without you. The young husband reassured his wife. Don't worry. Just take care of yourself and our little one. I hope you can come for the birth. The young woman asked him a question. And if I can't? He was bewildered because he hadn't even considered such a possibility. While the young man was thinking about how to respond, Gloria playfully said. Just try not to come back. Then you won't get away from me easily. You'll have to pay a very high price. I'll fulfill any of your wishes. Even buy a car? I saw such a cute little red car in the showroom that looks a lot like a ladybug. He kissed her on the tip of her nose. You'll have that cute car. I promise. Gloria saw him off, and he left her alone in his three-room apartment. Buster called her every day from Germany, worried about her health, and she eagerly told him how mischievous their little ones were. The due date was approaching rapidly, and Gloria hoped that her husband would be by her side during this important moment. Buster was promised a two-week leave, but Gloria went into premature labor. When he called to inform her of his arrival, his wife happily told him. Buster, congratulations. Now you're a real dad. We didn't have a son, we have two wonderful little girls. Do you want to talk to them? Buster listened to the sounds of his daughter's voices, and his heart swelled with happiness. He would remember that day for the rest of his life when he heard his newborn daughter's voices for the first time. The joy he felt then was unparalleled. He told himself. All right, Buster Brown. Now you're an exemplary father and family man, which means you have to forget about partying, bachelorhood, and other amusements. For the sake of family happiness, he sacrificed a lot, but he considered the game worth the candle, as a successful programmer and a happy father. After returning from the internship, he taught at his university for a while. However, Gloria's appetite grew with each passing day. He had to change his field of work. In the company led by Mr. Adams, everyone danced to his tune, but they paid twice as much as at the university. This allowed him to fulfill his beloved wife's main dream. He bought her a car that looked very much like a ladybug. Buster was so busy with work that he didn't even have time to eat properly, let alone stay updated on his wife's activities. Because of this, he didn't even inquire about how or where Gloria got her driver's license. The young woman waved a plastic card with her photo in front of him. Now I'm a full-fledged participant in traffic. Darling, what do you think about me slowly getting used to your gift? I'm very positive about it. Just be careful. I'll try. I don't understand why you need to warn someone about danger in advance. Gloria asked this with an undisguised smirk. Buster laughed. But that's natural. Such warnings are also a form of caring. I worry about you. That's why I try to protect you from unpleasant accidents. Buster tried very hard, but disaster couldn't be avoided. Usually, Gloria went out in the evening for a drive, as she called her short trips to gain driving experience. On that September evening, she fed the twins porridge and cheerfully said to her husband. All yours, Buster Brown. The girls are fed and watered. Your task is to entertain them until I get back. Time passed, but Gloria didn't return. The girls grew tired of playing and started to become cranky, 
he had to put them to bed himself. When the clock struck 10 p.m., he began to feel alarmed. Where could she have gone? She left at 6, and now it's already 10. He started dialing his wife's number, but all he heard was the mechanical voice of the voicemail, please try again later. An hour later, he became frantic. Buster called the numbers of Gloria's friends and acquaintances, but no one knew where she was. At 4 in the morning, he received a call from an unfamiliar voice. Are you Buster Brown? His heart sank, and Buster muttered quietly. Yes, she's my wife. Please, tell me, what happened to her? Unfortunately, I have to inform you that your wife had an accident. She's in critical condition in the intensive care unit. You need to come to the city hospital. Buster peeked into the bedroom to make sure the girls were fast asleep. He rushed to the hospital, hoping that the worst hadn't happened, but a doctor greeted him in the lobby. We did everything we could, but the woman suffered serious injuries and lost a lot of blood. She died on the operating table. It was a terrible blow. Buster howled right there in the hallway, like a wolf. In those dreadful moments, it seemed to him that the world had shattered into molecules and atoms, and only he remained whole and untouched, alone with his grief. Apparently, the surgeon was taken aback by such an unusual reaction from a man, and he called a nurse. Penelope, give this man a sedative injection, or we'll have to resuscitate him too. The nurse followed the doctor's instructions, and Buster calmed down. Inside him, everything was filled with a vacuum, and he no longer felt any pain or other unpleasant sensations. The dawn broke over the horizon. Buster reached for his pack of cigarettes, but it was empty. I smoked all the cigarettes in one go. I'll try to get some sleep. But as soon as he closed his eyes, the image of Glories appeared before him. She was trying to say something, but her voice couldn't break through the invisible transparent wall. Buster tried to guess from her lips what she was saying, but he only made out three words. Find that woman. The sleepless night had taken a toll on Buster. He drank three cups of strong coffee, but his head was still foggy, and every turn of his head caused excruciating nausea. I need to drink something, or I won't make it to work. The man rummaged in the medicine cabinet and finally found a pill there. He managed to swallow the medicine only on his third attempt, and he wondered in amazement. How can people swallow such pills every day? To speed up his preparations, he decided to make the simplest dish for breakfast, an omelette. In the meantime, Buster peeked into the children's room. Girls, wake up. Remember, we can't be late. Otherwise, Uncle Harry will close the gates in front of us. The sisters jumped out from under the blankets together and bombarded their father with questions. Dad, when are we going to the theater for the fairy tale? And are we really going to grandpa's in the summer? Buster answered his daughter's questions, and his mood slowly but surely improved. Unexpectedly, Veronica asked. Dad, is that lady really our mom, or is she lying? He fell silent because he didn't know what to say. As always, Bessie came to the rescue. Veronica, why do you need that lady? Our mom died, and we don't need anyone else. Understand? Veronica said. I understand. To avoid returning to this unpleasant topic, Buster entertained the children all the way to daycare, imitating different animals. Veronica and Bessie laughed heartily and couldn't calm down even when they arrived. Uncle Harry was waiting for the latecomers fully prepared. He looked at the newly arrived with suspicion but just sighed heavily. Buster encouraged the girls. It seems we didn't come late today. Let's go to your group, we'll meet in the evening. At work, he got a little distracted from his dark thoughts, but just before lunch, he decided to call his father. Dad, I need to talk to you urgently. I need your advice. Mr. Brown was surprised by his son's call. Either you can't reach me at all, or you show up yourself. What's happened with you? Father, it's not something I can discuss over the phone. Then come to me. I think it would be better for you to come to us. It looks serious if you remembered me. All right, I'll come. I can't promise today, but I'll come tomorrow. I'll ask Claude to take care of my affairs. Mr. Brown arrived in the evening the next day. 
Buster hadn't returned home yet, so the senior Brown had to wait a bit on the landing. Of course, Mrs. Watson couldn't remain indifferent. She first slightly opened the door and sternly asked. Who are you looking for, sir? Mr. Brown was amused by how two moving eyes watched him from the crack. He clicked his heels. Allow me to introduce myself, retired Colonel Brown. Why shout it to the whole staircase that you are a colonel? The door chain rattled, and the door opened completely. Mrs. Watson inspected Mr. Brown critically. You must be tired from the road, right? Let me treat you to some herbal tea. Mr. Brown was surprised by the hospitality of this woman. You know, I won't refuse a cup of strong tea. Mrs. Watson hurried to the kitchen and returned from there with a small tray. Help yourself, please. The man took the cup from the hostess and took a sip with pleasure. Oh, indeed, you have a magical drink. I had such tea when I served in the Far East. Buster told me about you. Don't you remember me? We moved into this house almost at the same time. My parents received this apartment through preferential allocation. Mr. Brown decided to tell a small lie. How could I forget? You were so young back then, but I must say, you haven't changed at all. The compliment awakened the most pleasant feelings in the woman's heart. You were handsome back then, and you're a real colonel now, and your son is very good, always polite. It's just a pity he lives alone. If the neighbor was overflowing with enthusiasm, Buster arrived in a depressed mood. He immediately sent the girls to their room, although they resisted. You will have a chance to talk to Grandpa. We need to have a private conversation with him. The man secluded himself in the kitchen, and his son briefly told his father about the appearance of the unknown woman, which had thrown him off balance. Dad, you're a professional in these matters. Help me figure it out. My head is spinning with various thoughts. I'm even afraid to voice them out loud. Don't burden yourself. We'll sort it out together. Are you sure we can unravel this tangle? You're underestimating me, son. Know that when Colonel Brown takes charge, all hidden secrets will be revealed. Just tell me honestly. Do you really want to find this woman? At first, I didn't want to, but now I do. Maybe it's not worth breaking everything apart? Think it over carefully. Buster also spent this night sleepless. However, he wasn't smoking anymore, he just lay in bed, staring at the ceiling, contemplating his father's words. Towards morning, he fell into a senseless nightmare and woke up with a headache. Mr. Brown was already doing something in the kitchen. I decided to play the housekeeper a bit. Brought some homemade products with me. He sliced the cheese into thin pieces and elegantly arranged them on a plate. Buster couldn't hide his surprise. Dad. You're like a restaurateur. You spoil us even more. You're too pale. You can't work yourself to exhaustion like this. There's no other way. I have two princesses growing up, after all. You need to get married. Dad, you're on about the same topic again. Let's not touch on this. Why don't you tell me where to start looking for this woman? We don't need to look for her. To begin with, we need to find out if there were any irregularities on the part of the medical staff in the maternity hospital where your wife gave birth. Pulling the thread from here is the easiest way. Father, I completely trust your competence. It's time for us to act. There are very strict rules at the daycare. Latecomers are left outside. Fortunately, at my workplace, they are more lenient with disciplinary violators. Buster finished his coffee on the go and took a few pieces of cheese with him. I'll treat Jim. He loves cheese. From the hallway, Buster shouted. Dad, I'm curious, how did the neighbor entertain you yesterday? We just talked about life. She's a very interesting woman. When the son and granddaughters left the apartment together, Mr. Brown took out his old notebook from his jacket pocket. Where is Miles Parker's number here? Ah, there it is. Probably my former intern has already become a colonel. Despite the many years that have passed, the colleague's phone number remained unchanged. 
Parker had indeed risen to the rank of colonel and headed one of the district offices in the state. He was very pleased to hear the voice of his former boss. Mr. Brown, you can count on me. I'll help in any way I can. Senior Brown had a quick breakfast and went to an important meeting. He forgot not only about his overripe age, but even about his beloved farm. This is what happens to real detectives, all they need is a lead, and they're off. Lorena was desperate. She had regretted her decision a hundred times already. But, as a loving mother, she couldn't have acted differently. She ran home, and Buster Brown's face stood before her eyes. Now she knew what real fury looked like. It resembled the face of the man who had kicked her out in disgrace. She tried to calm down, but an inner voice angrily told her. What did you expect, fool? Did you think your sin would be forgiven if you took on the responsibility for a sick child? No, dear. The heaviest part of your punishment is yet to come. Lorena cautiously opened the door to her apartment. Nelson. Mommy's home now. I'll feed you in a moment, and then we can read stories together. She entered the small room where a frail boy was playing with toy cars on the floor. Mom, I listened to Aunt Maria while you were away. Aunt Sophia is nice, but it's better with you. Please, don't leave again. She squatted down next to her son. I'll try not to leave you anymore. I just needed to meet with someone who could help you. A spark of joy lit up in the boy's eyes. Is he a doctor, your friend? No, he's not a doctor, but he's very kind. Lorena kissed her son and thought. How much he looks like his father. She prepared a modest dinner in the small kitchen and cried. The unfortunate woman couldn't understand how this could happen to her specifically. Why did I succumb to the persuasions of that painted doll? Why didn't I listen to my heart? Now nothing can be changed anymore. One of us has already paid for her sin. Now it's my turn. Lorena had only recently learned about the tragic death of Glories Brown. This event became the catalyst that made her try to change something. She desperately wanted to see her daughters more than anything else, but she had a hard time finding out where this family lived. Miles Parker not only became a colonel in rank but also in appearance. Mr. Brown scrutinized him with surprise. My, my. Do you go to the gym? Yuri laughed. I do, Mr. Brown. Of course, I do. However, it doesn't help much. As soon as you get a higher rank, it's like an extra five kilograms are added, and there's nothing I can do about it. Please, have a seat. I'll make tea now. Mr. Brown sat down and looked around. The office was not his, but essentially, nothing had changed since the times when he used to work there. Maybe except for the laptop on the desk, and there had been no repairs in the office for ten years or even more. Yuri sat down in front of him and scrutinized his former mentor. I understand you didn't come here for no reason? I heard that you're in the village now, even have a farm. I do, Yuri. Why don't you plan a visit? I'll introduce you to my farm, heat up the sauna. Yuri rubbed his hands together. Do you have a sauna too? Of course. You can't do without a sauna in the village. It's not just for bathing, it's to drive away fatigue and get rid of various ailments too. Yuri rolled his eyes dreamily. Really? Then I'll come. I'm a free man now. My wife found someone who earns more and stays at home at night. I'm not offended, I even understand her. Mr. Brown shook his head. You young people are fast. Just got married, now you're divorced. I need your help, Yuri, and preferably unofficial. Yuri immediately became serious. Something happened to your son? Well, no. My son is calm and doesn't get involved in trouble, if that's what you mean. But he does need help. Well, and me, of course. They talked for over an hour. At the beginning of the conversation, Yuri invited a young staff member dressed in plain clothes to join them. He carefully noted everything down, occasionally raising his hand to clarify something. Saying, goodbye, Yuri said. Austin is my best employee. 
Despite appearing very quiet and reserved, he can get anyone talking. He's an actor, very charming, but also observant. He notices the tiniest details. We know the maternity hospital. I think we'll have some information in a couple of days. As soon as something comes up, I'll call you immediately. Mr. Brown succumbed to a sudden impulse and entered a flower shop. He inspected the flowers for a while and finally saw what he needed. He bought a bouquet of large chamomiles, then went not to his son's home since there was nobody there, but to his neighbors. Mrs. Watson opened the door immediately, and upon seeing the colonel holding a bouquet, she blushed like a girl. Oh, come in, Mr. Brown. I'll put the kettle on. Buster rushed from work, checked his watch, cursed. He was already late. He needed to tell his father to pick up the girls. Not only were they late in the morning, but now in the evening too. His daughters were waiting for him. He immediately sensed that something had happened. Bessie, Veronica, what's wrong? What happened? Bessie spoke up right away. Nothing, Dad. Veronica turned away, looking displeased. Buster stopped and turned the girls towards him. You know you need to tell Dad about anything strange. Or any of the adults. Veronica couldn't hold back anymore. Dad, we saw that lady again today when we were playing, she was standing behind the fence. Buster went cold. So, this is becoming dangerous. We must definitely talk to this woman. But what to do with the girls? How can I let them go to the daycare or play in the yard now? By the time they reached home, Buster had discarded many possible scenarios. Besides taking more leave from work, nothing else came to his mind. There was a delicious smell of baking in the staircase, and Buster swallowed discontentedly. He had forgotten to have lunch today. He was scolded by his colleague right away. They opened the door and froze. The aroma wafted from their apartment. Veronica jumped. It's Grandpa. But it wasn't just Grandpa. Along with Mr. Brown, Mrs. Watson was in the kitchen. Buster even opened his mouth in surprise. The woman in their kitchen looked nothing like the perpetually grumpy neighbor. Hello? The father, who was currently sealing the pie filling into the dough, turned around. Oh, Buster. We're having a pie-making masterclass here. Wash up, we're about to taste. Dinner went great. Father cracked jokes. Mrs. Watson laughed cheerfully, and Buster surprisingly observed everything. Suddenly, the thought struck him that Mrs. Watson would fit perfectly into his father's country home. When everyone dispersed, Buster and Mr. Brown stayed in the kitchen. Dad, I'm starting to get scared. That woman observed the girls near the daycare today. She found them there. Mr. Brown frowned. Miles told me that we won't get any information until a couple of days. What do you think? I think I need to take more leave from work and not let the girls go to the daycare for now. Or maybe we should officially report it to the police. They'll find her quickly. Buster didn't reply, and Mr. Brown asked anxiously. Buster. Is there something I don't know? Buster looked out the window. He himself preferred not to remember anything, but on that night when he couldn't sleep and was smoking by the window, one detail resurfaced in his memory. You know, Dad. I remembered something. I don't even know if I need this memory or not. When Glories was in her fifth or sixth month, I found her medical record. Just sat down to read it. Blood tests, there was something else. I didn't understand anything, of course, but there didn't seem to be anything terrible there. But the sizes of the fetus were written there. One fetus, Dad. Do you understand? Then this detail somehow slipped out of my memory, but now I remembered it. Mr. Brown looked at his son attentively. Well, let's reason logically. First, after all, doctors and technology have a tendency to make mistakes. It happens rarely, but it does happen, right? Buster nodded, fearing the moment when his father would say, secondly. Secondly, if everything was correct, and the girls are indeed twins, and let's assume that the woman is right, then somewhere there is another child. Buster looked at his father with wide eyes. 
Dad, Bessie and Veronica are my daughters. This is not up for discussion. Mr. Brown raised his hands. Did I say anything different? Yes, I would chew my own throat off for anyone who says otherwise. But you must admit. There is another child, and if something is found out in the maternity hospital, we will have to find them. You understand this, don't you? And most likely, that woman, whom we really want to consider abnormal, can explain where the child is and what happened to them. Buster jumped up. Dad, I don't want to understand this. I don't want to accept this. Why can't we leave everything as it is? But he knew very well that leaving everything as it was no longer an option. The girls had been home with their grandfather for two days, and then their father announced. Here's the thing. I've decided to show Mrs. Watson my farm. Besides, Claudie has her own job, and I can't keep using her kindness for so long. I suggest taking the girls to my place. If you're worried that I won't cope, Mrs. Watson will be with me. Yes, and Claudie will always be around. Veronica and Bessie fell silent. They looked at their dad with some silent question, their hope shining brightly, and Buster looked back at them. Probably, it would be better that way. In the village, a stranger can be noticed right away, and the girls will be safer there. Finally, Veronica couldn't hold back. Dad. We'll listen to Grandpa. We're bored here. Bessie immediately supported her sister. Yes, you don't even let us go to daycare? Buster gave in, what else could he do? And the fact that Mrs. Watson was going with them played a decisive role, of course. He saw his family off in the morning and hurried to work. Fortunately, he had the foresight to call his boss and let him know he would be late, otherwise, he would have received another reprimand. Time flew at work, and Buster went home with one thought in mind, to lie down and finally fall asleep. Somehow, he felt incredibly tired during this time. It was unusually quiet at home. He even walked through the rooms and thought that he was left alone with the girls for the first time. He called his father, found out that everything was fine, didn't bother with dinner, decided to lie down immediately. He was about to leave the kitchen but cast a casual glance out the window and immediately woke up. He didn't want to sleep anymore. It was drizzling outside, and under this rain, he saw a familiar figure. Buster didn't hesitate for a second, he grabbed his jacket from the hangar and rushed down the stairs. When he dashed into the yard, the woman was no longer there. Buster looked around in confusion and noticed how she disappeared around the corner of the house. He ran there. He managed to see her turning and followed her, trying not to attract much attention. He didn't understand himself. Why was she hiding? Why not approach her and ask all these questions that had been tormenting him? The woman turned towards the old apartment buildings, and then, passing them, came out onto the path leading to the barracks. If Buster wasn't mistaken, they should have been demolished a hundred years ago, but people still lived there. The woman entered one of the barracks, and soon Buster saw her appearing in one of the windows. She leaned down as if talking to a child, and his heart gave a painful jolt. Twilight was falling outside. He stood there for a while and then resolutely approached the door behind which the one who had brought such turmoil into his family had disappeared. Lorena had just hugged Nelson when someone knocked on the door. She went to open it. It's probably our neighbor Sophia, who was looking after Nelson while I was away. I must have forgotten something. The woman swung the door open and gasped in surprise. You? Me? Can I come in? Lorena stared at Buster's angry face for a moment, then nodded curtly. Yes, come in. Sooner or later, we would have to talk. Buster walked in. He stopped, not sure where to go. Lorena slipped past him and gestured toward the room. Here, please. He followed her into the room and nearly stumbled. There, on the couch, sat a boy. The fact that there was a boy sitting there wasn't very surprising. However, the fact that he was the exact copy of a photograph of Buster himself from his childhood startled him considerably. Lorena silently watched Buster's reaction, then spoke softly. Meet Nelson. Buster, as if in a daze, approached the boy. 
Now he noticed that the boy was too thin, and there were a bunch of medicines on the table next to the couch. He extended his hand. Buster. The boy weakly smiled and shook his hand. Nelson. Buster felt like he had been hit by a shock. At that moment, his phone rang. Damn, of all times. He pulled out his cell phone, and the name's dad appeared on the screen. Of course, he couldn't ignore the call. His dad had his daughters. Yes, dad. Buster, Miles called me. And? He already knew that he wouldn't hear anything good. More precisely, he would hear something that would completely overturn their lives. He found the nurse who worked back then. In short, Glories gave birth to a boy with a heart defect, and apparently, your wife didn't want to deal with a sick child. Maybe there were other reasons. I don't know. Anyway, along with her, another girl gave birth. I can't say how things really were there. But these two girls. They swapped the children. Glories took the girls, and that girl took your son. The nurse said the boy was doomed. Buster remained silent. Son, why are you silent? We need to find this woman. I found her, Dad. I'm at her place right now. I'll call you back. Buster disconnected the call and put his phone back into his pocket. Meanwhile, Lorena was giving medicine to Nelson. The boy lay down and almost immediately fell asleep. Lorena silently passed by Buster and he followed her. In the kitchen, they sat across from each other at the table. She remained silent, and Buster didn't know where to begin. Lorena started speaking on her own. My biggest dream was to escape from home. My mother worked two jobs. My father drank away the money, abused both her and me. I couldn't understand why we were living with him. He didn't work, and if we left him, both of us would have lived much better. I asked my mother about it often, but she always said, Why are you so angry, my daughter? You know, if we leave your father, he will disappear very soon. I understood that, but I couldn't understand one thing, why should we suffer because of a person who was ruining himself? I firmly decided that as soon as I finished school, I would leave for the city. I thought everything would be wonderful there, Lorena said, sadly smirking, looking at Buster. Don't think I'm trying to make you feel sorry for me or justify my actions. No, I just want you to understand the motive behind my decision. The city didn't welcome me warmly. I failed the entrance exams for two colleges because I didn't prepare, and I got a job as a waitress in a cafe. Perhaps it was the best time of my life. Besides being fed, we were paid, and we were even allowed to take half of the tips. I even sent some money to my mother. It was there that I met Robert. I won't dwell on him. I'll just say he was wealthy. He threw money around, something I had never seen in my life. In our village, every coin is treated with reverence, but he spent more on tea than my mother earned in a month. He noticed me. And like a fool, I thought that now I would live like I saw in the TV shows. I was sure we would get married, and everything would be very good. When I found out I was pregnant, I couldn't tell him for a long time. I just wanted to present it in a special way so he would remember the moment, but it's a memory I will never forget. I told him in a restaurant when he came with his friends. He laughed at me, said he didn't need children from someone like me. Then he asked the owner to fire me. Throughout my pregnancy, I struggled with odd jobs, and when it was time to give birth, I knew I couldn't raise the children. I already knew I was having twins. It weighed on me, and I cried constantly. I knew I had to give them up for their own good. A very beautiful and obviously wealthy young woman was giving birth alongside me. I overheard doctors saying it was a difficult delivery, the baby was weak. She didn't cry, and I worried a lot about her. Imagine how strong she was, how composed. Then, then we started talking. I told her I had no choice but to give up the girls. Glories immediately, without hesitation, offered her plan. She said she and her husband could provide the girls with everything I could only dream of. She offered to take her son instead. She said he was no heir anyway. 
I was silent, shocked, and Glories added that she didn't want to go on looking like an elephant for another nine months. And if the baby dies, her husband will want another child anyway. It seemed incredibly cynical to me at the time. But Glories said that's life. If I think about how wonderful life would be for my girls, I would feel differently. Then she offered me money. A lot of money. She said it would be gratitude for her son not being alone until then. Do you understand? I thought for a long time. For two hours, and I agreed. Yes, it all sounded and looked very cynical, but Glories was right. It would be better for everyone. I don't know what I felt for Nelson back then. I was always thinking about the girls, and then, then Nelson fell ill, we were taken to the hospital, and I realized I couldn't let this boy leave the world. I ran through offices, asked for help from everyone I could. I cleaned the stairwells in all the nearby buildings. Just to survive. We survived the crisis. But for Nelson to live like other children, he needs surgery. They don't perform surgeries here, we need to go to the neighboring country. I managed to collect a small amount, but it's not enough. That's why I started looking for you. I understand perfectly that you could take my Nelson away from me, and of course, you won't give me my girls back, but I'm ready for anything. Just to help him. Buster raised his head and looked at Lorena. So, what is it? You need money? Somehow, I feel like you're just a fraud. Lorena looked at him attentively, and Buster was ready to beat himself up for those words. What was he saying? He clearly saw that this boy looked exactly like him, like two peas in a pod. Yes, I need money to save Nelson. She said it calmly, and suddenly Buster understood how difficult these words were for her and the whole conversation, in fact. I need to think. He stood up later, turned to her. Can I take this? Do you have any papers related to Nelson's illness? Lorena nodded, pulled out a hefty packet of documents from somewhere and handed it to him. We only have two months. If we don't make it, Nelson will be too old for such surgeries. We'll have to start all over again. But we don't have that much time. Buster rushed out of the apartment and hurried home. His mind was blank, completely empty. He didn't even bother to look into the packet because he perfectly understood everything Lorena had told him was true. Buster fell asleep right in his clothes. All night, he dreamt of Glories with Nelson in her arms, she was crying and asking for forgiveness. In the morning, he went straight to his boss. Mr. Adams raised his eyebrows in surprise. Goodness, Buster Brown in person and on time. What happened? He started the conversation in a humorous manner, but immediately stopped when he saw Buster's condition. Something did happen, didn't it? I hope your daughters are all right? Yes. I need to talk to you. Buster closed the door firmly behind him, in his hands was the packet detailing Nelson's illness. He only left Mr. Adams after two hours. Mr. Adams found everyone who could help Buster in such a situation within 20 minutes. When he was already grabbing the doorknob, the boss asked. What are you going to do with this Lorena? Just take the child away or do you want to punish her? Buster shook his head. I haven't thought about it yet. Right now, the most important thing is to save Nelson. Lorena opened the door, looking at Buster without surprise, she stepped back. May I come in? Of course. Buster entered the room, placed a large beautiful toy car and a picture book in front of Nelson. So, Nelson? Ready for a journey? The boy looked at him with wide eyes. So, mom told the truth? You'll save me? Of course, I will. How could it be otherwise? He heard Lorena crying softly behind him. Thank you. He wanted to shout. Thank you? What for? This is my son. I'm saving my son. But Buster held back. Perhaps only because he was afraid of scaring the child. Two months later, Buster and Nelson returned. While Nelson still needed care, it was decided at a family meeting that the boy, along with Lorena, would live with them, with her serving as a nanny. 
Before leaving for his village, Mr. Brown called Buster. Son. I'm not a very soft person, you know. But in life, things don't always go as we want or think is right. Lorena and Glories, they both committed terrible acts, but try to put yourself in Lorena's shoes. Not this Lorena, though she too, but the one when she was giving birth to twins. Buster wanted to explain that such acts couldn't be explained, let alone justified, but his father didn't have time. Mrs. Watson, who had suspiciously often started visiting his father, was waiting for him in the village, delaying her stay for a week or two. Lorena tried not to cross paths with Buster. He still worked, spending evenings with his son and daughters. Buster couldn't think of the right solution, the right way out of this situation. If he started an investigation, Lorena could end up in prison, and the girls. He wasn't good at these things. So, he simply counted the days. Strangely, the girls suddenly became prettier, they constantly had elaborate but beautiful hairstyles. It seemed like they dressed the same way as before, but somehow, it all looked much more charming. He saw that Lorena had changed too. The worry hadn't disappeared from her eyes. It was especially noticeable when she looked at him. But she seemed to have blossomed. Buster suddenly realized how young and beautiful Lorena was. One weekend, when Buster planned to sleep in, the phone rang. He grumpily felt for the phone and seeing the time, 6 a.m. and the caller ID, Dad, he picked up the receiver. Dad, what's happened? Why do you think something happened? Well, did you see the time? Happy people don't watch the clock. Mr. Brown chuckled foolishly. Dad. Are you all right? Yes, everything's fine. So, gather your big family, load them into the car, and come over quickly. But. No buts. Today, we're celebrating an important event. So, hurry up. I hope you understand that you need to take Lorena and, of course, Nelson and the girls need some fresh air. Father hung up, and Buster didn't even have time to ask what the event was. Orders from the colonel were not open for discussion. Wake up, everyone. Room started buzzing with activity, Lorena came out to him. Something happened? I don't know. Probably, yes. But maybe not. Dad called and ordered everyone to be in the village urgently because they are celebrating some important event. If only we knew what event it is. Lorena smiled, and Buster suddenly noticed how much her smile transformed her face. She immediately looked so young, so tender. You can't upset Dad. He's good to you all. Buster looked at her in surprise. When did she figure out that Dad is good? She saw him only a few times, and he always just gave orders. An hour later, they were on their way. Nelson blushed while they were getting ready, constantly asking the girls. Do goats bite? Are rabbits beautiful? Buster realized that the boy had never been to the village. Probably, Lorena never took him to her parents. When they finally set off from home, Buster asked quietly. Lorena, where are your parents? She quickly glanced at him. They're gone. Nelson was only three years old when our house caught fire. Everyone thinks my father, drunk, fell asleep with a cigarette. I'm sorry. It's okay. During the remaining journey, they listened to the girls enthusiastically telling Nelson about the adventures awaiting him. The gate and the door were wide open. Frankly, Buster didn't understand anything. He quickly ran up the steps. Mrs. Watson, in a beautiful dress, was setting the table. She was assisted by the equally elegant Claudie, while father and his former comrade Mr. Adams were having a conversation on the couch. Oh, my son has arrived. Welcome. Dad, can you explain what's happening? Father stood up, waited until everyone, including the arriving guests, entered the house, and hugged the embarrassed Mrs. Watson. We've decided that happiness shouldn't have an age limit and decided, so to speak, to legalize our relationship. Buster slumped onto the couch, utterly bewildered. Now that's father for you, always surprising. Bessie and Veronica had already climbed onto their grandfather, and then Nelson couldn't resist and approached, immediately finding himself in warm embraces. 
Buster looked at Lorena, she was smiling again, the second time that day. I wonder, did she never smile before, or did he just not notice? The celebration turned out to be very cheerful. Perhaps, they all missed the usual joy. Buster watched with a smile as Mr. Adams and Claudie danced a slow dance. It seemed that Claudie had finally found her happiness. When the music faded, the slightly tipsy Mr. Adams delivered a passionate speech about how as soon as he retired in six months, he would move here immediately. Embracing Claudie, he asked. You won't chase me away, will you? When everyone had settled down, Buster went out to the porch for a smoke. Occasionally, he returned to cigarettes. His father sat down next to him. Smoking again? Yes. Buster put out the cigarette. Father sighed. What are you waiting for, Buster? What are you thinking? The girls need a mother. You've been avoiding the female sex, my boy. Dad, who needs such happiness as I am? Don't forget, I have three kids now. Don't you really understand who needs it? Buster looked at his father in surprise, and he sighed, as if he were talking to someone insane. Only a fool wouldn't notice how Lorena looks at you. I understand everything, but you should pay attention to her, Buster. She's a good one. And she's not a stranger. Father left, and Buster sat there for a long time, wondering how on earth his father could come up with such a thought. Lorena looked at Buster with fear, and he was spinning around like a madman. Buster, what are you happy about? Do you even realize what having four children means? Of course, we already have triplets, it's like having one child. Well, what triplets? Lorena sighed sadly. Buster looked at her slyly. Are you my wife? Don't you want a child from me? I do, but four. Lorena made a small mistake in her calculations because the conversation took place at a very early stage of her pregnancy. After she was discharged from the maternity hospital, they didn't have four but five children. The Brown family was enriched with two more boys, strikingly similar to their grandfather. He immediately noticed this resemblance and said, I will personally take care of raising these boys.